The year was 1944. The world had now been at war for five long years and was mired in the middle of a conflict that would result in the death of more than 60 million people, making it by far the deadliest war in human history. A war not just about politics, resources, territory, or even religion, but a battle that would ultimately decide the fate of the free world. John Maselli was a senior in high school. I graduated high school in June. I was 18. And I, by September, I was in service. However, John's training for the war started long before graduation. There was a course uh, our teacher, one of the teachers in high school was giving about, uh, one of it was identifying planes, mm. front or foe, mm -hmm. and it was uh, oh, a book about that thick that we got, and it would have all the pictures, silhouettes of different airplanes, uh, American, British, or German. This was not a class discussing the pros or cons of war. The United States had already joined the fight. This was about being prepared. Just ID, just identify. And then it had bits about weather, so it had, and it had bits about uh, airplane and uh, what makes an airplane fly like. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a pre, pre-flight or pre-Air Force thing. And I took the course, I really enjoyed it because I was interested in planes. In fact, by that time, John's interest in planes was well established, unbeknownst to his parents. I had uh, taken a streetcar one day all the way down to the south side of Chicago where the Civil Air Patrol gave me a flight in a small plane, hmm. which I had never had before. And, uh, of course, I didn't tell my folks or anybody about that. My mother wasn't too keen on flying anyways. It was the third year of U.S. involvement in the war, and with the world on fire, it was hard to think of anything else. No, I had no ambition, I don't recall, because it seemed everybody around me was going into service. America had been reluctant to get involved in what had started as a European conflict, but when we did join the war, we were all in. Yeah, just about everybody in my class went into service because that was it. Everyone, including John's future wife. Yeah, we heard everything about the war. The war was very prominent in our lives. Mary had a brother in the Army, which contributed to her interest but support for the men who fought was unanimous. And the planes would fly over the school, oh, our yeah. high school, and we girls would run to the window and wave to the guys, <laughs> and they would, would oh, yeah. waggle their wings for, for us. However, in World War II, the women of the United States were the farthest thing from simply cheerleaders on the sidelines. When I was 16, I got a job in a war plant, we were making, they were making um, uh, lunch boxes for the Army. Hmm. At least that's what they told us they were. They were. Hmm. And I was using a riveting machine, which scared me half to death. Well, yeah. But we did it. All this while still in high school. And after graduation... Straight out of high school, I got a job with the uh, Army Signal Corps. Um, I graduated in 44, so I went to work at Admiral, uh, Admiral Corporation. They were making uh, radios for, field radios for the Signal Corps. Hmm. And I was, they employed me. I was 17. This may sound unusual, but in reality, it was anything but. This was pretty common. Were a lot of your friends also? Oh my God, yes. Everybody I knew was working. Hmm. Uh, my mother was working in a war plant. My sisters were working in war plants um, when they graduated. Meanwhile, John, having graduated, was deciding how best to serve his country. When I got done with the physical, they said, John, if you want to go to Marines, there's a station wagon downstairs. <laughs> wow. If you want to go in the Navy, 
you have a, a week, I guess. And if you wanted to go in the Army, you had three weeks or something. So I said, I'll take the Army. Three weeks later, John was following in his father's footsteps. I reported, and they took me to Camp Grant, Illinois, which is the camp my dad went into when he was drafted in World War I. This legacy of military service did not sit well with John's mother, who already had two sons enlisted. My mother's, her oldest son had gone to service. Mm -hmm. Cyril was already in service. And as soon as I was through school, I went in service. Now, like Mary thought it was ironic, here she had three sons who were sent in service fighting the country that she came from. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of a double negative, you know, that yeah. didn't sit, I'm sure it didn't sit well, and I, as she might have cussed us out, but she never, she just prayed a lot, I think. Mm. And all three of us got back, which yeah. was phenomenal, I think. After a series of tests, it was determined that he had qualified for the Air Force, so John and 50,000 other recruits headed off to gunnery school. And in gunnery school, you saw the 50 calibers on that thing. Well, you had to learn to take this thing apart, put it together again, with gloves on, and blindfolded, because you could be up high, and it could be dark, and, and it'd be freezing cold, and if your hands touch metal at that temperature, it just sticks to it. John excelled in gunnery school and was even considered for a position as an instructor, but in the end it was decided his skills would be better put to use on the front line. So it was time to meet his crew. And from there we went to Boise, Idaho as a crew, and our pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, and navigator were all with us, and then uh, six enlisted men, nose gunner, upper gunner, tail gunner, uh, waste gunners and engineer. So it's, it was 10 or 11 men crew and then we went to Boise and we all trained together. We got to know each other, we have leave together and uh, yeah so that's and that was very, it was, to me it was a lot of fun. Unlike in Vietnam, in World War II John said he didn't see much abuse of either drugs or alcohol but then as it is now if you put enough young men together, there is bound to be one or two who will take it a little too far. This crew member, the upper gunner, was going to show, he had gone to Purdue for a semester or so. So he was way ahead of us guys. We had just got out of high school. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any. And he was going to show us how to drink. Mm -hmm. So he filled up a glass of cheap rot gut. It was probably four roses or something. And he just pushed it down, and he got sick as a dog. <laughs> and he was throwing up all night. <laughs> and the, the bombardier, his name was Frank Amon, that's right. And the bombardier, Suppies, which was uh, our pilot's brother-in-law then after they got married, he, he went and rented a room in the motel. And he says, John, you stay with him, will you, while we go on? And here I am with this jerk, throwing up all evening until they came and got me. And uh, what a stump thing that was. But then, so I didn't get to go out with them at all. They were going to go out. I don't know where they went or what they did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he was going to show us how to drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. College boy, you know, he was way ahead of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aside from that hiccup, their time was spent flying and training together as a crew. And these were just practice missions. So uh, sometimes we would go alone, sometimes we'd go with three or four planes because the theory in, in bombing over Germany was to fly as tight as you could so that planes couldn't come through your formation because mm -hmm. that was very dangerous for the crew mm -hmm. 
uh, if they could come through your formation, usually they would take out a plane with them. But even the training was dangerous, and the crew was not without its close calls. We had a training flight to Corpus Christi, mm -hmm. and so at the same time they were training a navigator, a pilot, co-pilot, and some gunners. Uh, they might have taken us out over the Gulf. They had uh, fake planes with uh, bed sheets, mm -hmm. just a little framework. You go out on the, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, um, uh, the coast of... No. Uh, Texas? Texas? No. Well, the water's only about that high. Yeah, sure. You could walk for two blocks and you're still only that sure. high, see? So they would put splash tockets out there like an airplane with bed sheets, just a stick. Sure. And we would come down low and fly at these things, and you had colored bullets. Mm. See, I have blue and somebody else have red. Oh. So the blue ones would give a blue mark, and then they tell you how many good, good shots you had, and the other guy have the red. Sure. So there were a couple of gunners in the plane. There was a pilot, there was a co-pilot, they were training a uh, navigator to go to Corpus Christi and back. They were training a pilot to make a landing. Well, they probably had the new guy was going in for the landing, and he might have dipped in the dead engine, and I don't think you could bring it up when you're down too low mm. and you're going too slow. Mm. So he crash-landed in the Tex uh, cotton field, which was great for us, mm. and we slid until we hit a road, and the road comes up. Ooh. You know how the roads are. They yeah. filled it up a little yeah. bit, and it sheared off the whole bottom of the plane. Wow. But nobody was sitting in a position where he was going to get killed. Wow. We were on the deck. Uh. There's a deck, and then below the deck is maybe 10, 20, uh, not 10 feet, about 2 feet or 3 feet. Sure. So, Ooh. and that deck held the radio equipment and the, the uh, oxygen tanks. Uh. It just hook up on the wall, you know, and they're all hooked up together. So, oh, if you're at a station... You just plug in your oxygen. Well, with, I mean, with that much oxygen and gas, I mean... It yeah, it was, it was risky. Well, then when the plane stopped, I could hear... Sss. It was uh, air tanks that given out. It wasn't uh, planes. Good. But uh, we all got out. We all got away from it. And then they heard this guy calling, and some of the guy, one guy was caught under a turret. He had fallen on him or something. Mm. So I ran to get an axe so we could chop this guy out of the spot. By the time I got back, the Red Cross from the base, the meat wagon was there, and they were all putting him in it, you know. He was, he was okay. Uh, he might have broken an ankle. Despite their best efforts, everyone survived the training. And with that accomplished, it was time to join the fight overseas. We were supposed to pick up a brand new airplane and fly it to England. And the way they would do that, they'd fly to Brazil, and then they'd cross to Africa. And from Africa, they'd fly up to England. See, they would take a kind of a roundabout way, but it kept you out of uh, actual combat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it gave the crew time to be together, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, the tail gunner got back late so they gave the plane to somebody else, and then we took a train to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and we were going to wait for the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary had just landed in New York Harbor with 15,000 wounded from the Battle of Bastogne. With that many wounded packed like sardines, the ship was far from ready. But after a week of cleaning, they were ready to set sail through waters infested with enemy subs, all too eager to keep its new precious cargo from reaching the fight. We boarded the Queen Mary, and uh, it took days to board because we were taking 15,000 men overseas. And what they did, you took uh, two Corvettes, escorted you out of the harbor hmm. for about maybe a half a day or so. And then by that time, the Queen Mary had gotten up speed. And the Queen Mary could go like 30 knots or something, which was faster than any submarine could. Oh, yeah. 
So, and the way it would work, they would go like a minute straight and then they'd zigzag. Mm. All the way across, mm. night and day, you'd hear that propeller come out, bum, 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 bum. But we had no escort then. Right. Once they took us out, you know, then we were free. The Queen Mary before the war had been a luxury cruise and had been designed under normal conditions to hold far fewer than 15,000 men. Normally, maybe two. Yeah. You see, you got state rooms and they had a ballroom. And even when we went across, there were uh, a few hundred uh, Red Cross women that was going with us. I didn't get to see any. My radio operator, they had a dance while we were going over, I guess with officers. And uh, we enlisted men weren't allowed in there, but our radio operator broke in and he's, he was an older man. He said, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> Fire me? Yeah. Send, send me to send war? Me old. <laughs> so the men made the most of their journey, knowing that some of them would never make it home. Now it was time for war.